Hello, I'm Shelley Quinn, and we welcome you to 3ABN Worship Hour. Pull up a chair, grab your Bible. We're going to do an old-fashioned Bible study today. You know, Christian tradition puts a lot of emphasis on the first day of the week, Sunday. What we will do today is look at every scripture in the Bible that mentions the first day of the week to see if it supports Sunday sacredness. Now, don't worry, there's only eight scriptures to review. What we want to do before we get started is go to our Lord in prayer. Let's go now. Our glorious and loving Heavenly Father, we come before you to thank you for Jesus and your word and your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the anointing that is on your word. Lord, send your Holy Spirit now to be our teacher, to bring clarity to this topic. We love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. When God created our earth, he established time for us. Now, he created a solar cycle to establish the time of the year. He set the sun in the middle of our solar system, and the time of our year is measured by how long it takes the earth to orbit around the sun. He also set up a lunar cycle. God created the moon. He put it into orbit around the earth, and we measure our month by approximately the time it takes the earth or this, the moon one full orbit around our earth. But you see, he created our bodies for a 24 hour cycle. And he, only the creator knew that our bodies work best on this 24 hour cycle. So what he did is he established the rotation of the earth on its axis. And it, this gives us in 24 hours, there's one cycle. It gives us 12 hours of light per, so that we can be productive and then 12 hours of dark so that we can have restfulness. So God created these scientific cycles to establish a year, a month, a day. But why do we measure a week as we do? Seven days. There's only one reason. This is a divine cycle that God set up and established in his word as his mark of authority over time. Now, the interesting thing is, if we look back through history and apply common sense, we see that the seventh day has continued to identify God's reign over our time. When we look at the first creation account in Genesis 1, time was measured from evening to morning. The Bible says, from evening to morning was the first day. Evening to morning was the second day. Evening to morning was the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh day. But it's interesting. Genesis 2 has a second creation account. And in Genesis 2, God establishes a weekly cycle by putting a 24-hour period in there. That's like a temple in time. And God himself paused. He rested, he blessed the day, and he sanctified the day. Listen to what he says in Genesis 2, 1 through 3. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it. That means to set something apart for holiness. He sanctified it because in it he rested from all the work which God had created and made. Now, if you have your Bibles open to Isaiah 58, we're going there. Here's throughout the Bible, the Old Testament and the New, the days of the week were simply referred to as the first day, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and the seventh day. 
because God blessed and sanctified the seventh day, he laid special claim to it. So Isaiah 58, let's look at verses 13 and 14, because when God laid claim to this special day, he calls it his Sabbath. Isaiah 58, 13, he says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, that's the Sabbath, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord. So the Sabbath is the day of the Lord, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to rise on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. It's interesting. Jesus affirmed the Sabbath in Mark 2, 27 and 28. We don't have to turn there. This is going to be very familiar to you. Jesus affirmed this as a special pleasure, a gift that God made for humanity. He says in Mark 2, 27 and 28, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man, that was his favorite title for himself, is also the Lord of the Sabbath. So we see established throughout the Old Testament and the New, the divine weekly cycle. It is a divine origin. And you know what? We're still celebrating a seven-day week ever since creation. So as I said, during New Testament times, the days of the week were simply identified by numbers first day, second day, all the way through to the seventh day. And they did not use the current names that we do now. So how did we get the names for the days of the week? Well, they come from ancient celestial beliefs and from cultural tradition of paganism. Let me give you a quick list. I think it's interesting. The first day, Sunday, is considered the day day of the sun. It was the worship of the Romans that named Sunday. The second day, Monday, is derived, the, the title Monday is derived from Luna, which means the moon. It is the day of the moon. Tuesday was associated with Mars, the god of war. Wednesday was named after Mercury, the messenger of the pagan gods and the god of commerce. Thursday was honored in favor of Jupiter, who was the king of the Roman gods and the god of the sky thunder. The sixth day, Friday, is linked to Venus, the god of love, goddess of love. But the seventh day, that named Saturday, it was named after Saturn. Here's what's interesting to me. Saturn was the ancient Roman god of fun and feasting. So in the Bible, we find the word Sabbath or Sabbath with a plural 172 times, both in the King James and the New King James. Most often it is referring to the seventh day, the weekly Sabbath of the Lord. But I want to make a distinction because I think this is important. It also is used to identify annual Sabbaths. Now, what is an annual Sabbath? That was a festival day, a feast day that God identified as belonging to the Israelites. See, he identifies the Sabbath, the seventh day of the week, as my holy day, and a permanence is attached to it. But the weekly, excuse me, annual Sabbath days belong to the Israelites. That's how scripture describes it. And they were meant to be temporary. Why? Because everything about those feasts, those festivals, 
that God gave to Israel pointed to the coming Messiah. So all these covenant feasts merely foreshadowed the work and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we find in Colossians 2.17 and Hebrews 10.1 that they're done away with. Scripture concludes that these were abolished, these annual Sabbaths, at the death of Jesus. And new covenant Christians aren't obligated to keep them. Hebrews 8.13, in fact, explains that the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, was made obsolete by the new covenant. So let's look at the original manuscripts that use first day of the week and see what the Bible says about the first day of the week. Does the Bible identify the transference of worship from God's holy day, the Sabbath, the Lord's day, to the first day of the week? Would it surprise you to learn that the term the first day of the week that identifies Sunday is used only eight times in the Bible. And all of those are New Testament scriptures. So let's look at those now. Five of those eight references are found in the Gospels. And they all refer to the time, the events around resurrection morning when Jesus' female disciples went to the tomb. So let's look at those real quickly. Matthew 28 and verse 1. Just take a note of the scriptures for these five. We won't take time to look them up, but we will look up the, the last three. Matthew 28 verse 1 says, Now after the Sabbath, Jesus died on a Friday. He rested in the grave on Sabbath. He was resurrected on Sunday. It says, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. So that's our first reference. Then Mark 16, 1 through 2, just basically repeating that, He's, it, Mark's account says, now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, James and Salome brought spices that they might come and anoint him very early in the morning on the first day of the week. They came to the tomb when the sun had risen. So that's two references. Now Mark goes on to say in, in verse 9, Mark 16 verse 9, now when he, Christ, rose on the first day of the week, that's how we know Christ rose on Sunday. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. There's three. Luke has two scriptures, but I want to kind of set this up. Actually, he's got one reference. I want to set it up. Luke 23, 55 and 56. Luke gives us a little more detail that I find interesting. And you know what I think it is? Luke was a Gentile. He was writing to a Gentile. So I love the Gospel of Luke because everybody else was Jewish, writing from a Jewish perspective. And quite often, if you're not a Jew, you may not understand everything they're saying. But Luke gives us some insight as Gentiles to what the Jews were thinking. So Luke says in chapter 23, 55 and 56, the women, he's speaking of these same disciples that we just looked at, who had come with him from Galilee, followed after. They're watching when he's being buried. They observed the tomb and how his body was laid. Then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils. They had seen the crucifixion, the bruised and bloodied body of Jesus. They were anxious to anoint his body for burial. But listen to what he says. We're still in verse 56. And they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. This is after the death 
of Jesus on Friday. They rested on the Sabbath in accordance to the commandment. So then he says in Luke 24 and verse 1, Now on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. There's four of our eight scriptures. The fifth is John's account. And same events, he says in John 20 and verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So we see these first five references to the first day of the week or Sunday are all surrounding the events of the female disciples going to the tomb on the Sunday morning of the resurrection. Now, open your Bible to John 20 and verse 19, because now we're going to look at the last three references to the first day of the week. In John 20 and verse 19, that's John 20, verse 19, here's what the apostle writes. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, being Sunday, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Jesus was crucified. He had been buried in the tomb. Now his body was missing. The report was everywhere. And the disciples still didn't believe about the resurrection. We'll show that in just a moment. So they are locked behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. They were afraid that the Jews would come after them, thinking maybe they had stolen the body. So now Christ suddenly and unexpectedly appears in their midst, and they are still reeling from the chaotic events that they had been through since Thursday evening in the garden when Jesus had been seized and then taken and flogged and, and gone through the mock trials, if you will. So when Christ came into their midst, what was their reaction? They were trembling in fear, and the Bible says that Jesus ate broiled fish and honeycomb in front of them to prove to them that he was not a ghost. Some Christians claim that John 20, 19 is the first Christian worship service on Sunday. Let me ask you, does that sound like a worship service? That being the first day of the week, John 20, 19, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, these people were huddled together in fear. And they didn't even believe that Jesus had risen. Mark makes that clear. If you have your Bible, just flip over or flip back to Mark chapter 16. We'll look at verses 11 through 14. Mark chapter 16, verses 11 through 14. When they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, that would be Mary Magdalene, they did not believe. After that, he separated in another, or he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country. These are the two disciples from Emmaus who were returning home after the crucifixion. And after Jesus told them who he was, they ran back to Jerusalem. But what does it scripture say? Mark says in Mark 16 and verse 13, they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. That's what Mark says. 
And in verse 14, Matthew 16 and verse 14, it says, Later, he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table, and he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. So now, turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 16, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. This is when Paul is admonishing believers to systematically lay up in store some money on the first day of each week for preparation for a special collection. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the church of Galatia, so you must do also. On the first day of the week, this would be the seventh reference to the first day of the week. Let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. The NASB says this way in 1 Corinthians 16, 2. On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside, the literal translation is by himself, in other words, at home, and save, storing up as he may prosper. This is collection for the starving Jews. It would have been uh, uh, wheat, grains, different things, and Paul's going to come to collect. 1 Corinthians in the Amplified 16 verse 2 says on the first day of each week, let each one of you personally put aside something and save it up. So now some interpret this text to mean a collection that would be made by the church. But the context doesn't reference a worship service. It doesn't reference a public meeting but rather a storing up in some special receptacle at your home. So now let's look Acts 20. We'll look at verses 7 through 12. Turn to Acts chapter 20. This is the final reference to the first day of the week, our eighth reference, Acts 20, verse 7 through 12. It says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together, to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. So Paul had been in Troas at this point for seven days. Surely he had met with the saints on many occasions. But he is getting ready to depart. So they are gathered to break bread and have a farewell message. What does the breaking of bread mean? It means to share a meal. You know, if you look, much of the fellowship of the New Testament Christians was sharing a meal together. And they called it breaking bread because they tore the bread apart, broke it to make sure there were enough pieces to go around. In Acts 2.46, listen to this. Acts 2.46 says they daily got together to break bread. It says day after day they regularly assembled in the temple with united purpose and in their homes day after day they broke bread and they partook of their food with gladness and simplicity and generous hearts. So Breaking of bread can refer to communion service, but in this instance, just as they did daily, I believe that what happened during Paul's farewell message is that they were getting together for a fellowship meal at the end of the week that he had spent in Troas. So it mentions, and that's Acts 20, it mentions the first day of the week. What Luke is doing, he is putting in chronological order everything that Paul is doing on this trip. So he mentions the first day of the week. Then he mentions he's departing 
the next day. So if it was Roman reckoning of time, Romans reckon time like we do, midnight to midnight, then this would have been on a Sunday night. If it was Jewish reckoning of time, which was sunset to sunset, this would have been Saturday night. The interesting thing is that scholars are divided. I mean, it's so interesting if you start studying this. Some scholars are absolutely convinced it's Saturday night. Others think it's Sunday night. But whatever it is, we know it was an evening service. We know that there were a lot of lamps. Luke says that there's a lot of lamps lit. And this is the farewell message of Paul. Now let's continue reading in Acts chapter 20. We'll pick it up in verse 9. This wasn't a regular worship service. I think the reason that Luke recorded it in the first place is because of the miracle we're about to see. Luke 20 and verse, excuse me, Acts 20 and verse 9. And in a window sat a certain young man named Eutychus who was sinking into a deep sleep. He was overcome by sleep, and as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story. Have you ever listened to someone just go on and on and on? I mean, this is a nighttime meeting, and Paul is preaching till midnight. So poor Eutychus is sitting there in the window, and his eyes are getting heavy, and he's like, and he falls backward out of a third, out of the third story window to the ground. But listen to this. He was taken up dead. But Paul went down, fell on him, and embracing him, said, Do not trouble yourselves, for his life is in him. This is when, like Elijah, laid on the son of the widow and brought his life back. And then verse 11 says, when he had come up, had broken bread and eaten, so they go up and they eat, and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. So Paul spoke a long time. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not just a little comforted. So the text doesn't mention that they met together to worship, and I believe that Luke probably recorded this event because of Eutychus. So that's it. There's only eight texts in the New Testament in the entire Bible that actually say the first day of the week. So there's five references to the women disciples coming to the tomb on resurrection morning. Our sixth reference was a group of frightened disciples who were huddled behind closed doors for fear of the Jews. The seventh reference regarded a special collection and Paul is planning this for the disadvantaged believers and he wanted when he came he wanted to go around and collect it without anybody having to say oh we haven't put anything in store. The eighth re one that we just read in chapter 20 of Acts is referencing Paul's farewell message. They're getting together for a farewell meal and he, ra he performed a miracle to raise a dead man. It's interesting, none of these scriptures, none of these passages mention that the disciples had gotten together to worship and it doesn't mention that they were singing psalms or it just simply records the facts of their meeting and the timing of the event. We've just looked at the only eight scriptures that mention the first day of the week, Sunday, in the Bible. Not one of them transfer the sacredness of God's holy day, the Lord's day, the Sabbath, to the first day of the week or Sunday. We've already considered that he laid claim to it. I want to read that again. Isaiah 58, verses 13 and 14. If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable, 
my holy day and shall honor him, God, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then you shall delight yourself in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the high heels of the earth. The Lord's holy day is the Sabbath. Three times in the Gospels, Matthew 12, 8, Mark 22, 8, and Luke 6, 5, Jesus said, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. And he tells us that this is his day, the Lord's day. So now flip to the last book of the Bible. Revelation 1 is where we're going. And we're going to look at Revelation 1, verses 10 and 11. Many people in tradition attribute this particular reference to Sunday. But let's look at it. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the first and the last. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. John had just referred in, in his gospel. John was the last one to write. So his gospel, his three little epistles and revelation, were, he was the last author of the Bible. He had called Sunday the first day of the week. He always referred to the seventh day as Sabbath. And Jews knew that the Lord laid claim that that was the Lord's day, as we saw in Isaiah 58, 13, and as Jesus announced himself that he was Lord of the Sabbath. So here's the principle. You know, uh, Bible scholars disagree again. Many say, oh, the Lord's day is Sabbath. And then many say, oh, no, by tradition, the Lord's day is Sunday. But that wasn't the tradition when John was writing. And so what we want to do is use the principle in Bible hermeneutics. Hermeneutics just means translation. So there's a principle of interpretation when we're translating the Bible, and it is called the law or the doctrine of first mention. According to this guideline, the first occurrence of a concept or a term in the Bible establishes its fundamental meaning or interpretation. So John is writing to Christians who were still keeping the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was called my holy day by the Lord. It, Jesus said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. So John's mention of the Lord's day was most likely identifying the Sabbath. Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere do we find the transference of the sacredness of the Sabbath to the first day of the week. Jesus kept the Sabbath. In Luke 4 and verse 16, it says, And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. So it was his custom. His disciples always kept the Sabbath. In fact, we looked in Luke where the women had seen the crucifixion and they went home to prepare the oils they wanted to anoint his body. They watched where he was laid. But it says in Luke 23, 56, they returned and prepared these spices and fragrant oils and they rested on the Sabbath in accordance to the commandment. So obviously Jesus had not told them that the Sabbath was to be changed to Sunday. In fact, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus came to magnify the, the law of God. And he certainly did in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5, 21 and 22, he equates anger and hate with the spirit of murder. And then in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, he 
identifies lust as the spirit of adultery. So he magnified the spiritual principles of these laws. He did not abolish the Ten Commandments that God had written with his own finger on stone and had placed under the ark as the, basically I call it, God's charter of rights for the foundation of his government of love. If you think about it, reflect on this thought for just a moment. Jesus came to pay our penalty, the death penalty, the penalty we deserve because we're all sinners. Sin is a transgression of the law of God. He came to pay the penalty for us for breaking God's law. Now, if God had intended from the very beginning to set aside the Ten Commandments, then Jesus died in vain. It doesn't make any sense. So not one single scripture authorized the transference of worship and the sacredness of this special rest that God gifted to mankind, his temple in time, this seventh day that established God's mark over time and our weekly cycle. There's not one single scripture that transfers that from the seventh day of the week, which is Saturday, to the first day of the week, which is Sunday. So here's the question. Why do Christians worship on Sunday? Why do Christians worship on Sunday? It's no secret. The Catholic Church proudly claims that they alone made the change and the, tr uh, the transference of the sacredness of the Sabbath to Sunday. There's hundreds of official quotes, but let me give you one. This is from James Cardinal Gibbons, written in Faith of Our Fathers, page 14. And he, this is quoted from the office of Cardinal Gibbons through Chancellor Thomas in November the 11th, 1895. Here's what he says. This is Garden, Cardinal Gibbons speaking. Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change was her act from Sabbath Saturday to Sunday. And the act is the mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. You know, that's widely taught in the Catholic Catechism and many other Catholic documents. They are proud of the fact that it was the Catholic Church that transferred the sacredness from God's holy day on the Sabbath to the Sunday. So Christians were still worshiping on the Sabbath 300 years after Jesus was uh, his ascension to heaven. So here's a quote from Charles Heffley, and it's in a book called A History of the Christian Councils. It's volume two, page 316. So the Council of Laodicea in AD 364, over 300 years after Jesus' ascension, Christians are still worshiping on the Sabbath. So now the church officials come together and they passed a law called Canon 29, which decreed Christians shall not Judaize, is what they call it, and be idle on Saturday. So they're scorning them for that, but shall work on that day. But the Lord's day, they're presuming their transference of his holy day to Sunday. They shall especially honor, and as being Christians shall, if possible, do no work on that day. If, however, they are Judaizing, they shall be shut out from Christ. So the church, now the universal church, that we would call that the Roman papal church, is now threatening to discommunicate 
excommunicate, I knew that didn't sound right, excommunicate any Christian that kept Sabbath, the seventh day, as the Bible instructs. So it's easy to understand why Catholics worship on this Sunday, but what about Protestants? The Protestant Reformation began in October the 31st of 1517. By historic definition, Protestants, absolutely, the, the reason they rose up was to reject the idea that the Pope, his claim to ultimate authority over matters of religious faith. So when the Protestants rose up, they claimed sola scriptura, the Bible and the Bible only. They claimed the Bible as their only teacher and the only infallible source of God's authority, of God's commands, of God's will. So this is what the Protestants rose up to use the Bible for the practice of the Christian faith. So, if so, why did Protestants, who can find nothing in the Bible to change it, why did Protestants accept the Sunday, or the Sabbath, the Seventh day Sabbath, being changed to Sunday? Well, listen to this, it's fascinating. The Catholic Church actually explains it to us. This is from the Catholic Mirror. It's an article, a magazine of the, of the Catholic Church. This is September 23, 1893. James Cardinal Gibbons in the Catholic Mirror states this, the Catholic Church for over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant. Remember, Protestantism tr started in uh, 1500s, and it says over 1,000 years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her divine mission, the Catholic Church changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Protestant world at its birth found the Christian Sabbath is what the Catholic Church calls Sunday, too strongly entrenched to run counter to its existence. It was therefore placed under the necessity of acquiescing in the arrangement. They're saying Protestants came along and found that now Sunday worship was so entrenched because they were if they would be excommunicated if they hadn't changed to Sunday. But when the Protestant Reformation began, it was so thoroughly entrenched that they just acquiesced, is how he says it, to the arrangement, thus implying the Catholic Church's right to change the days for over, th to change the day for over 300 years. So they'd already been practicing this for 300 years. The Christian Sabbath, that's how the Catholic Church calls Sunday, is therefore to this day, the acknowledged offspring of the Catholic Church as spouse of the Holy Ghost. They're saying, we gave birth to Sunday worship. And he says, without a word of remonstrance from the Protestant world. The Protestants aren't calling Catholics out on this. They're actually acquiescing. So in an ironic twist, the Catholic Church actually chides Protestants who are following this Sunday keeping tradition. Listen to Reverend John O'Brien. This is The Faith of Millions, page 421 and 422. And here's what Reverend John O'Brien says. Since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified as the Sabbath of the Lord in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday? 
Isn't it amazing, he says. Curious is the word he used. And then he goes on. Yes, of course, it is inconsistent. But the change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. And they, the Protestants, have continued to observe custom, even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon any explicit text in the Bible. The observance by Protestants remains the reminder of the Mother Church from which non-Catholic sex broke away like a boy running away from his mother, but carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of hair. So they're saying by Protestants taking Sunday, they are still connected to the Mother Church. You know, it's interesting. If you read Catholic documents, they go through all that I'm presenting to you and more to show that there is absolutely not a single scripture that supports the transference from the Holy Sabbath to Sunday. The Bible refers to the first day of the week, Sunday, as a normal working day. The change of worship to Sunday is based solely on papal tradition of the Roman Catholic Church. So the question is, do you believe that the Pope, the papal system, has the power to change God's commandments? I'm going to give you five scriptures. Just write these down because we're going through them quickly. In 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's 2 Timothy 3.16. Isaiah 40 and verse 8. Isaiah 40 and verse 8 says the word of our God stands forever. Matthew 24 and 35. Jesus says heaven and earth will pass away. But my words will by no means pass away. That's Matthew 24, 35. Malachi 3, 6 the Lord says, I am the Lord. I change not. Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If God intended to change one of his Ten Commandments, written by his own finger on stone, placed under his throne, the Ark of the Covenant, within the most holy place, don't you think he would have made it clear in his word? He would have announced it. But instead, when Jesus foretold the destruction of Jerusalem that happened in A.D. 70, nearly 40 years after his resurrection, he expected his people to still be observing the Sabbath. Listen to this. Matthew 24. This is where Jesus is telling of end time events and things that are to come. He's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem when the armies are surrounding Jerusalem. He says in Matthew 24 and verse 20, pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath for then there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So Jesus is saying, pray that this isn't going to happen on the Sabbath. He expected them to continue resting and worshiping on the Sabbath. See, Genesis 2, 3 God rested on the seventh day. He blessed the seventh day. I believe only God can bless the day. He sanctified the seventh day. He set it apart for special holy purposes. And he warns us through his prophetic word in Daniel 7, 25, he warned that a little horn power would come up from pa pagan Rome. This little horn power would introduce a counterfeit time and change his law. Listen to Daniel 7, 25. He shall speak 
pompous words against the Most High shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend, intend to change times and laws. If you want to know more about the Little Horn Power, just go on our website. You can find all kinds of resources. So the seven-day cycle was not determined by movements of the earth or movements of heavenly bodies, but the seventh day weekly cycle was of divine origin. And you know what? When God gave his commandment, when he first just spoke his commandments to remind the people there when they got to Mount Sinai, to remind them of his law of love. Listen to how he gives the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day. That's the only commandment that begins with remember. You know, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make an image or bow down to it. The third commandment, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Now it comes along. Remember the Sabbath. These four show our love and loyalty to God. That's what that is. Now, the other six, you shall honor your mother and father. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not covet. But the Sabbath is the only one. Listen, Exodus 20, verse 8 through 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do nor work. No work. You nor your son nor your daughter, your male servant nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. So the Sabbath blessings actually were magnified and meant to include all people even the animals. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. He made it holy. The Lord is explaining here in the Sabbath commandment that this is a memorial. Sabbath is a memorial of him as creator. And if we understand, this will counter false ideas of evolution. He reminded the people he made it holy. He blessed the day. And then soon afterward, he said, this is a, uh, also a more memorial that I am the one who sanctifies you. What does that mean? God will make us holy. He is the covenant maker and the covenant keeper. In Exodus 31, 12 and 13, he says, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak also to the children of Israel saying, Surely my Sabbath you shall keep. It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. In other words, righteousness is by faith. Come to me and I will do a work in your heart. Years later, when God repeated, or Moses repeated the Sabbath commandment to the second generation of Israelites who are right at the edge of the promised land, he reminds them now that the Sabbath shows that God is their deliverer and their redeemer. So the Sabbath memorializes God as our deliverer and redeemer. Let's read that. Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. Observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, no work. you nor your son, your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, your ox, your donkey, your cattle, the stranger within your gate. But then here's what he says. Remember, this is verse 15, that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God brought you out from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath. 
The Sabbath is a memorial of creation, redemption, sanctification, and Jesus affirmed it throughout the Old and the New Testament. His disciples kept this. It's a temple in time that reveals our love for God, and we get this time to experience His love. 1 John 4, 19 says we love him because he first loved us. And Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. I have to say this. The Sabbath is not the memorial of Christ's resurrection. Sunday is not the memorial of Christ's resurrection. You know, Friday is just as important the day he died as the day he resurrected. But in the New Testament, I don't have time to read this, but read Romans 6, 3, and 4. What memorializes Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is baptism. So why do church, Christians go to church on Sunday? It's no secret. The Catholic Church claims the credit for changing Sabbath worship to Sunday. They assert authority over God's law. And they say, this is a tradition of man. You know what? Jesus had something to say about that. Matthew 15, 9, he told the Pharisees, in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandment of men. So we come down, choose you this day whom you will serve. Will you keep God's divine commandment or will you observe man's tradition? Please review this for yourself. Please understand that this is an important doctrine of the Lord. We love you and we thank you for joining us. Bye-bye.